church of Ephesus write? The words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and have found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up under, up, bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. How would you feel if Jesus were here today and he would have said those words to us. I know your works. I know your deeds. What he's saying is, there's nothing about you that I don't know. I know what you do. And more importantly, I know why. Now, the book of Revelation begins with Jesus after we see him in all his glory in chapter 1 for the next couple of chapters talking to seven specific geographically located churches in Asia Minor. The first one he begins with is, is with Ephesus. And, and I want you to suspend what you know about Ephesus for just a moment and just think about what he just said to them. How would that make them feel, do you think? I mean, what he's basically saying is, the word of God, my word, is important to you. You value it. You value it so much that you're able to discern true teaching from false teaching. And when a false teacher comes along, you don't put up with it. You compare them with the Word of God and you point out that what they're saying is not right and you do that not because you want to humiliate them but because you want to protect them from being anti-God and you want to protect the people in your congregation. And it sounds like this was a very arduous, difficult fight. He talked about their patient endurance. He talked about them not giving up and staying in this battle Now, how would it make you feel if he said that about us as a congregation? Now, what he's, what he's about to say here is, is directed toward a specific local church. But the thing we know about local churches is they're made up of individuals. And realize that the Bible tells us that when somebody puts their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, they come into his family and he puts the Holy Spirit, uh, the Holy Spirit comes to indwell inside every single believer so that the Holy Spirit, God, is inside of you and me and he knows everything. So when Jesus is saying to this church, I know your works, he's saying to the people, He's saying to me, and he's saying to you, I not only know what you are doing, I not only know what you did last night, what you did last week, what you did last year, I know why you did it. I understand what motivates you, what moves you. I have to say that of all the sermons I have preached in the near future that I can recall, I feel the most unworthy to preach this message. Because what we're about to talk about is something that, that hits really close to the bone for me. It is not something that I am a hero at. It is something that I am more than a fellow struggler at. But I want you to know that First Baptist Church is a place where you can be you, where you can be real. We all blow it. We all fail. We all 
fall short of the glory of God. The quote of Paul. It doesn't mean that it's we just let it go and we don't deal with it. What it means is we, we understand that we continually, every single day, need the gospel. A simple summary of the gospel can be something like this. I am more sinful and lost and broken than I ever dared dream. But I am more loved and forgiven and accepted than I ever dared hope. Both at the same time. We will never be perfect until we stand before God. But realize that right now you are standing before God. Not only does the Spirit of God dwell inside of you, but the Spirit of God dwells within this place because God's people are here. And there's not a place that you can go to escape God's gaze. God is here. God is wherever you were last night. God will be wherever you'll be this afternoon. He knows our works. Now, when you look at the core values of this particular church, the church of Ephesus, I don't know, it seems pretty impressive to me. The unyielding hard work, persevering truth, solid biblical teaching, and their work was paying off. They had probably some very charismatic um, uh, false teachers, had, had probably led a group of people away. We don't really know who these teachers might have been. Later on, he talks about the Nicolaitans, and really we don't even know who the Nicolaitans were. There's some conjecture, but we just know that they were false teachers, and the, some of the leaders must have been rather charismatic because they were able to convince people to follow after them. So the thing is, the arguments and the problems and the things that we struggle with today are really important to us. But in the future, people may not even remember what it was. But what we need to make sure we're doing is, is taking whatever those issues are to the Word and making sure they line up with the word because Jesus commends them for this. Your core values are spot on. What you're doing is exactly what you need to be doing. What church would not be proud to have Jesus say this about them? Now, in Acts chapter 20, bear with me, but there is a, a reason for this foray off into Acts. In Acts chapter 20, as Paul was saying his final goodbyes to the elders from the church of Ephesus, he said something prophetic. He said, Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God which he obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock and from among you. So there'll be some that'll come from outside who will worm their way into the congregation, and then there'll be those who'll be convinced from the inside, and they will work their way out, trying to bring people with them. Will arise men twisting things, uh, speaking twisted things, to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore be alert. Remember that for three years I did not cease, night or day, to admonish everyone with tears, and now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. He warned them and he said, here is what is going to help you fight this enemy, these woolly wolves, the word. And they took it to heart. And they, they studied the word. They, they allowed the word to study them. And when the false teachers rose up, they could handle them. Now, I asked you to suspend what you know about the church of Ephesus for a minute. A minute. And imagine that, that you knew this about a church and you said these things about a church. They have been fighting the good fight. They're standing strong to the word. They're not yielding. They're not giving in to the culture around them. They're being true to the, the word of God. What's the next thing you think Jesus might say to them? Keep up the good work. Maybe. Maybe he'd be saying, boy, you've been working really hard. You need a break. Give yourself a vacation. Maybe he would just say, you know what? 
here's a couple more passages that'll be helpful for what's coming next. I, I don't know what he might say. I don't know about you. It's hard for me to not know what he already said and, and to suspend my thoughts on that. But before we jump to it, I want to ask you. First Baptist Church is a church that is committed to the Word of God. First Baptist Church is committed to studying the Bible, to understanding the Bible, to living the Bible. Do you think that Jesus might say something similar to us as he said to the church of Ephesus? I wonder what he sees when he looks at us. Listen to what Jesus said to this doctrinally sound, correct teaching, false teacher challenging church. This is verse 4 of chapter 2. But I have this against you. You have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, where you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. What they were doing was correct. Their doctrine was sound. The issue was not their what. The issue was their why. Simon Sinek was right when he said you've got to start with why. What is the thing that motivates us to do what we do? God doesn't settle and is not interested in just our outward activities. The things that, that seem to say to show everyone around us that we're following after Jesus. Because those can do nothing but really kind of draw attention to us and, and make it seem like we're really great people. When inside... As Jesus said to some of the religious leaders of his time, maybe we are just as vile and defiling as, as dead people's bones. The church as a whole in Ephesus had a suspect why. Jesus is not concerned just that we do the right thing. He wants us to do what we do out of our love for him and others. Love for others that does not grow out of our love for God becomes mere sentimentality and often is done with self-serving motives. Whenever we show that we love somebody else without the motivation being our love for God, we are in danger of promoting ourselves and promoting our agenda. And even though it might be a great thing, that thing may not be what God is about. Because our minds and our hearts need to be in sync with His. And we respond and we act and we live because of who He is and because of what He did. Remember what Jesus said when He talked about His Father in, in the Gospel of John? Several times He did this, but in particular between chapters 15, 16, and 17. He said, I don't do anything that I haven't seen my Father do. I don't say anything that I haven't heard my father say. He had to be so in tune with his father that, that he knew his father's mind. And that's what Jesus is saying to us. You've abandoned your first love. You've forgotten what this is all about. You've forgotten your why. You've got the what down. But you've forgotten your why. And when we forget our why, and once become being right becomes the core thing that defines us, then we forget that the person on the other side of the aisle from us is not the enemy. They have been duped by the enemy. They're blinded by the enemy. They're the very person for whom Jesus came and died. They're the very person for whom we are to lay down our lives. When love is the motivation, everything changes. So, 
He says they, they abandon their first love. To abandon means to leave, to send off, to let go, to leave off or leave behind or set aside. They began living this relationship with Jesus based on their mutual love, but they kept doing the right things and gradually their love grew cold. And what they ended up left with was the shell of love. The outward signs of love without love being there. Love does not die in a second. Love dies a slow incremental death as minute bites are taken from your heart until it doesn't beat anymore. It wasn't a sudden one-time event that cooled the flames of their love. It was the gradual bit-by-bit daily choices that moved them away from their intimate relationship with Jesus. Connie, my wife, and I do a lot of uh, marriage and premarital counseling. And one of the things that, that she will say often in our counseling is it's not the big things. It's not the little things. It's the repeat things that will blow your relationship up. Those things that go unresolved. Those things that we sneak past without really thinking about it. They had abandoned their first love. And the sad thing is a loveless relationship can be indistinguishable from the outside. You can see a couple and everything looks fine. They're sitting next to each other. They're holding hands. They smile. She laughs at his goofy jokes. Everything seems to be fine on the outside, but on the inside, they're miles apart, even though they're in the same car. It doesn't happen in just an instance in most cases. It's something like the toll of words left unspoken, a kindness unexpressed, patience withheld, physical expressions of love overlooked, words of affirmation, encouragement, support exchanged for silence. Listen with fresh ears to the words of a very well-known passage. It comes from the message version. Listen to how Paul describes this sort of loveless relationship. If I speak with human eloquence and angelic ecstasy, but don't love, I'm nothing but a creaky, rusty gate. If I speak God's word with power, revealing all his mysteries and making everything plain as day, and if I have faith that says to a mountain, jump, and it jumps, but I don't love, I'm nothing. If I give everything I own to the poor and even go to the stake to be burned as a martyr, but don't love, I've gotten nowhere. So no matter what I say, no matter what I believe, no matter what I do, I'm bankrupt without love. When love is our motivation, our words become, when love is not our motivation, excuse me, our words become the window dressing of love with no action to back them up. God's word becomes a tool to demonstrate our preeminence as our focus is taken off of God and put on ourselves. Prayer becomes the way that God can prove that he loves me by doing what I want, what I feel like I need. When love is absent from my part of the equation. Why is prayer so difficult? Why is it so hard for us? I have to say that one of the reasons it's been hard for me over the years is because there, there are times I take my, my mind, my heart, my eyes off of the motivation, off of my love for him. I mean, think about this. Why did Jesus pray? 
When you compare it to why we pray, why do we pray? We need something. We have a financial need. We have a physical need. We've, somebody's got cancer. We've got issues going on. So we pray. We pray a lot during those times. And when everything's going great, well, we don't pray so much. Jesus, Jesus didn't have any sin to, for, to be forgiven. Nothing to confess. Jesus spent his time with his father because he wanted to be with his father. He wanted to understand his mind. And, and, and I think he wants us to get this. Our Father wants to, us to know His mind. Our Father wants us to be with Him. He wants us to spend time with Him. He wants us to know that He knows our name. And He's okay with your middle name, even though you don't want anyone else to even know what it is. He wants you to know that everything about you, He knows it. And He wants you to know everything about Him. That's why we pray. Not because we have to, but because the God of the universe wants to spend time with us. And he gives us the opportunity to spend time with him. Now it's interesting to me that nothing in this passage indicates who the object or what the object of the abandoned love is. Who or what is the object of the love that they had abandoned? I think Jesus, because he spoke these words to John, I think Jesus left it a little bit vague, intentionally. You can see the different options if you look at different translations of these particular verses. The Good News Bible translated it this way. You do not love me as you did. Who would be the object of love there? You do not love me as you did. Jesus would be the object, right? You don't love me the way you did. And then there's the, the Moffat translation. It says, you have given up loving one another. Who's the object there? Other people. So there's at least those two options. A third option has been given that maybe maybe the love that, that they had forgotten is the love for the lost, the love for people who are far from God. Well, I think that the Phillips translation and the one we just read in, Ephi in uh, uh, the... Um, English Standard Version have it right when they say the Phillips translation says you do not love as you did at first the object is love and ESV you have abandoned the love you had at first and what he's doing is I think he's turning our mind back to what Jesus said in the Gospels when he he defined love this way. He defined, well, the, the fulfillment of God's greatest commandment with love. And he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. What he's saying is, when you love God with all your heart, heart mind, soul, and strength, you will love your neighbor as yourself. Because in and of yourself, you can't love anybody else because the only person you're ever going to love is Number one, unless God's love motivates us to love, we will not be able to love others. They had abandoned the love they had at first, their love for God, that enabled them to love others. Now, it's intriguing. Listen to how Paul described the Ephesian believers when he wrote to them. Now, the book of Acts that we quoted earlier was written in 62 A.D., the book of Ephesians also was written in 62 A.D. The book of Revelation was written 95, 96 A.D., so 30-some years separation, right? So in the book of Acts, he told them, wolves are coming in, protect yourselves, protect your doctrine, protect the flock, protect everybody. And they did it. Paul says this to them. For this reason, because I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. Their love for each other was renowned. People knew about it. And they understood from Paul that they needed to make their doctrine sound, and they focused on that, and they lost sight of love. 
I want to say, I understand that. I don't know about you, but there are times when I get my head down and I am going for it. One of the dark sides of my leadership is in the past, I don't do this anymore. I use people to accomplish tasks because I'm, I'm a type A driven sort of person. That is exactly what the church is not supposed to be about. I would covet your prayers for me to make sure that doesn't happen. But you know what? I don't think I'm alone. I bet there are some other people in this room who feel the same way. Maybe you're sitting there right now and you're, you're feeling your heart kind of a little bit of conviction. Yeah. I think I find myself sometimes doing what I do just because I'm supposed to do it. And it's not the love of God that's motivating what they now had was a shell of love, activities of love without the passion, without the heart. And if they stayed in this loveless condition, they would cease to be as a church. He said, I will come and remove your lampstand unless you repent. The church would be no more. A church where love goes undercover cannot does not function as Jesus' church. When love is not our motivation, we are not functioning as his church. Jesus gave the mark of distinction for every follower of Christ and by extension to every assembly of followers of Christ. When he said, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. A church that is a love-free zone is a spirit-free zone and is not a church. Jesus commanded them to do some open-heart surgery. And he told them how. He said, Remember therefore from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. Remember, repent, and do. If you want an R word that will make it easier to remember, remember, repent, return. Return back to the things that you did at first. To remember means to always keep in mind, hold on to the memory, to keep on remembering. To repent means to turn from what you were doing and return to what you did when your love was new and passionate. Do what you do motivated by your love for God and others. Remember, repent. I want to spend the rest of our few minutes together here talking about how we can rediscover our heart of love. How we can rediscover our heart of love. We began the year with 40 days of prayer, um, not because it's a tradition that we do, but because I know that I need, and I know that we as a congregation need to be reminded that prayer is not the preparation for the battle. Prayer is the battle. And I'm only going to know God's mind when I'm spending time with Him. We've already got the Bible study part down as a congregation. We are true to the Word. But sometimes it feels like our prayer is just kind of an add-on. Our prayers quickly move from, from exploring the, the nature of who God is to our grocery list of things that we want, things that we need, our reasons to be mad at God when He doesn't come through for us. And I'm not pointing fingers, I'm looking in the mirror. That's not who God wants us to be. He is 
more concerned with why we're doing what we're doing than what we're doing. Begin with your why. Let's remember what it was like when we first realized that we were in trouble. We were a sinner lost and on our way to a Christless hell. But Jesus Christ took our sin on himself and he died in our place and we bowed our knees to him. We bowed our hearts to him. We bowed our lives to him. And we gave him everything. Holding nothing back. And we said, I'm yours if you'll take me like I am. I accept your death on my behalf. Remember what that was like. If you've never done that, do it now. Because he will invade your world like nothing else. But realize he's not going to ask for Sunday morning. He gets everything. Your salvation costs you nothing. It costs him everything. But once you come into his family, he owns you. He is your Lord. He doesn't expect you to be perfect. I've already told you. Look, I'm the pastor, and I told you I'm not perfect. Hang out with me for a while. You'll know it pretty quick. But we're all moving in that direction, becoming more and more like Jesus. And if I'm not more like Jesus next year, then probably I'm not the guy who ought to be the pastor here. Because it's not okay for me to just say I'm flawed and wallow in it. We need to be becoming more and more like Christ in everything we do. Because our motivation continues to be his love. And we keep going back to that. So, how do we rediscover our love? First, we remember that prayer is supposed to be a constant conversation. Prayer is supposed to be a constant conversation. Prayer is not just something that we do at a specific time. I mean, think about your best friend is with you for the day. And they're sitting there with you, but you don't talk to them. Well, it's not time to eat. Why would I talk to them? It's not that specific time I have set aside to pray for 30 minutes. Why would I talk to him? Well, that's silly. We would never do that. Your best friend is, is with you. I mean, uh, I've, I've been around people who have really best friends. I mean, when, when Connie gets together with some of her friends, there, there's not any quiet time because they can't wait to hear all the details of the, each other's lives. I mean, it's different with guys, right? Guys are like, how's it going? Great. Great conversation. <laughs> right? But that's not what God wants from us. God wants us to know that, that he wants to spend time with us. Prayer is a constant conversation. Prayer should also be thoughtful. Prayer should be thoughtful. We should not disengage our brains when we pray. We're supposed to love the Lord our God with all our hearts with all our minds soul and strength right with our minds so I'm going to challenge you to consider who is God what is he like open up the Psalms as you come to a time of prayer and begin reading and as you come across things stop and speak them back to God. Pray them back to God. Talk to him about his, his creative genius and how he made everything that there is and how you can't, you can't handle looking to the sky and, and trying to fathom how many billions of stars are there. And Job tells us that he calls them all by name. God made everything. As you read through the Psalms, as you read through different passages, allow those to expand your mind as to who God is and focus on who God is. I know for me, I have to be honest, sometimes my prayer degenerate into vending machine prayers. Um, I put in my quarter or dollar nowadays, and I get my candy bar, right? God, give me
give me this. God, do that. God, help so-and-so. And when I'm really serious, oh, Father, almighty, you know, awesome, gracious, phenomenal God. And I add all those superlatives. And God is saying, you know what? Just come to me. Last week, Pastor Waigi told us, when Peter was walking on the water, he said, this is a great example for all of us. Sometimes we don't need flowery prayers. Sometimes we just need, when we're going down, say, Jesus, help! When we're in a constant place of, of, of conversation with God, then God knows what's going on in our lives, and he wants to meet our needs. He is more concerned about what's going on in our lives than we are. So Jesus said in Matthew 6, 8, when he was teaching his disciples how to pray, he said, your father knows what you need before you ask him. We don't have to be worried. He knows. And that means he cares. Prayer is about enjoying him for who he is. Notice God's fingerprints everywhere around you. As you go throughout this week, don't just think about your prayer life, but think about who God is and how he's active in this world. I found a passage that I don't know that I've ever seen before. It's in the book of Job. Job 12, 7 and 9, it says, But ask the beasts, and they will teach you. The birds of the heavens, and they will tell you. Or the bushes of the earth, and they will teach you. The fish of the sea will declare to you, Who among all these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this? His fingerprints are all over creation. Go throughout your day with a sense of wonder and anticipation. Expectation of what God is going to do. Um, Connie is working on her second book, a follow-up to Redemption's Bell. And um, she's doing some research on on uh, the Oregon Trail and and the, the trek that people took from the East Coast over to California and all the things that happened there. And she came across something that she pointed out to me, and I just want to share some of this with you. In the mid-1800s, half a million children joined their parents in wagon trains on horseback and on bare, by barefoot, crossing from east into the frontier lands across the continent to the west. Many of them described their journeys as one great picnic excursion. Many of them, excuse me, uh, for them it was hot. They walked barefoot over entire fields of prickly pears. Food was scarce. Death became commonplace for many families. And yet they described in their later years, as they looked back, it as a great picnic excursion. Now, how could they do that? Well, here's why. In his memoir of his journey westward, D.B. Ward said, It was a long, long journey full of grave responsibilities for the older members of the family. But he also admitted, For me, a lad of 15, it was the most interesting six-month period of my life. A 13-year-old girl said, There were no regrets on my part at leaving my relatives and my native town. It means for me an adventure. It was hot. It was hard. It was treacherous. But the kids tended to see it as an adventure. One seven-year-old remembered with great fondness the months that it took he and his father to build the wagon that would carry their family to California. The same kid. His spirit of adventure undiminished after traveling all summer, barefoot through the desert sands, through sagebrush, greasewood, and cactus, seven-year-old Jesse Applegate got to ride a riverboat. That's what he wrote about. He got to ride a riverboat. Now, everyone had chores when they were on the prairie, and the kids often were given the chore of gathering up firewood. Well, on the prairie, there's not a lot of firewood. But there is some burnable resource. <laughs> Buffalo chips. And there were stories about little girls in their little, you know, proper dresses and things at the first part of this journey, walking around and being very gross.
grossed out by picking up buffalo chips, but by the end of the journey, they made a game of it. And they would run and scout for the families that were coming behind them with their wagons, and they would set up in different areas, and they would try to find out who could build the biggest pile. The kids made an adventure out of it. You know, when we go through life, we forget that Jesus tells us that we're supposed to be like little children. Experiencing the wonder of God with every fresh day. Yes, as we get older, there are aches and there are pains and there are problems. The world might be spinning out of control from our perspective. But God is still on the throne and God, the God of wonder who made it all, is still the God of wonder. And he still is doing things around us. I have a friend named Brett Reinsmith who loves to climb mountains and uh, rock climb. He was over in the Alps, and they were on a four-wheel drive trail, and it was bumpy, and they'd been on it for hours. And he said, you know, I, I just kind of felt compelled. I, I asked him to slow down and let me get out. And they weren't going very fast anyway, so it was not a big deal. He said, I got out and I walked for a few miles. And he said, Len, I've never seen the most beautiful flowers in all my life. And he reached down and he plucked this little itty bitty flower with five blue petals and white right in the middle. And he described it to me and he said, God met me there. And if I'd stayed in that four wheel drive vehicle, I would have missed God that day. Let's not forget the wonder of who God is and what he's done for us. How do you explain beauty if there's not a designer? It's amazing to me that it's so easy to forget and so easy to walk away. I want to challenge us to consider looking for God in the mundane and humdrum things. Our son Colin gave Condi and I these little tags. Anybody have one of these? Anybody tell me what that is? It's a free frosty at Wendy's for a dollar. Anytime you go to Wendy's for this whole year for free, Colin got these for us. Anyway, so the, the thing that, that's cool about this is not just do I get half Frosties, and I had two yesterday. <laughs> <clears throat> but, but when he gave it to Connie, she told me this story, and I'll tell it on her behalf. He turned it over, and it says, I, I love adoption. The Frosty was enough but to know that his heart beats with ours was something else for us too. You know, when, when we slow down and we stop and we look at what God's done, it will remind us that he loves us in the simple and the mundane things of this world, of this life. I have a coffee mug, tea mug, sorry, I don't drink coffee. This is one of the best gifts I've ever gotten. It says, Good morning, this is God. I'll be handling all your problems today. I make sure to have something out of this every day and let God remind me that I'm not in, ch in charge, that I'm not in control, that he's got me, he's got my back. You can see God everywhere, but do you notice you notice that he's seeing you, that he has something he wants to say to you. I think God wants us to experience life as an adventure. Old is a state of mind. Like a kid, drive around in wonder, exploring, curious. Ask daily, who am I? Now, however you answer that question, 
whether you talk about how old you are, how young you are, how educated you are, how wealthy you are, your state stature of life, the, the past successes you've had, how will you answer that question? There's always only one answer that really matters. Who am I? The answer is the one that God gives. I am loved by God. That's who you are. You are God's beloved daughter. You are God's beloved son. That is the only answer that matters. So, this was where it got convicting for me. I wasn't sure how to end this, and um, uh, I felt like God kind of directed me this way. So I'm going to ask just a couple questions. Some would look at our prayer lives and ask along with God, Son of man, can these bones live? Can these dry bones? Look at your own prayer life. Okay, now pretend that no one else is in the room. Just you and God. Look at your personal prayer life. Does God want to answer this prayer? Will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? Would you join me in making this our prayer this week? Psalm 85, 6. Would, will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? Oswald Chambers said, Prayer is the vital breath of the Christian, not the thing that makes him alive, but the evidence that he is alive. Not the thing that makes him alive, but the evidence that he is alive. Remember, that God is a, a still alive and active in this world and in your life. Repent from taking him for granted, ignoring him, loving anything more than him. In return, do what your love for God and your love from God motivates you to do. Live each day as his adventure of love. Father, I long to know you better. I long to experience your love in the depths of my soul. And I am so grateful that you come to me at the pace that, that I can handle. And you're making me more like Jesus every single day and every single year of my life. And you have that same passion for every single person in this room. Father, I pray that we would diligently pray this week, inviting you to revive us so that we may rejoice in you and live each day.